reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. I'm Ed Crane. I'm president of the Cato Institute. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about our institute, uh, why we formed it, what its purpose is, what we hope to achieve with it. A lot of people don't understand even what kind of organization uh, Cato is, but we are what is known as a public policy research institute. Uh, I was working in Washington back in 1976 on a political campaign and I discovered that there was such a thing as public policy research groups and I was very impressed by the uh, impact that they had, the leverage that they had given their relatively small sizes. In those days, uh, the major players in, the, in that field were the American Enterprise Institute, which was kind of a conservative pro-business think tank and the Brookings Institution, which was known for its liberal policy prescriptions. In any case, uh, perhaps it shouldn't have come as a surprise, but not that many new policy ideas are generated by people in Congress. Uh, it turns out that there's a whole community of institutions and organizations near Congress, outside of Congress, that are independent of it, that are constantly generating ideas for uh, uh, policy prescriptions for the issues of the day. Uh, my concern, after having been impressed by Brookings and AEI, was that neither organization really had the philosophy that I think America was founded on, which are the classical liberal or libertarian principles of uh, peaceful relations among nations, uh, respect for individual rights, free enterprise, and limited government. And so when I uh, moved back to my uh, home in California after the campaign, I met with some people and we uh, decided to go ahead and organize an institute that would promote policy options that were consistent with those principles in which this country was founded. We picked the name Cato because of something called Cato's Letters, which were revolutionary era pamphlets uh, written by a couple of Englishmen named Trenchard and Gordon and widely read in the American colonies in the early part of the 18th century. Uh, Cato's letters were said to have played a major role in uh, laying the philosophical underpinnings of the American Revolution. And since the Cato would like to see, those of us involved with Cato would like to see a renaissance of those principles applied in today's world, we picked that name. Uh, we can discuss today a, a whole range of issues that uh, Cato is involved with, but that basically is the background. We formed a public policy institute, which is now located in Washington, D.C., uh, for the purpose of developing policy options that would help move America closer to the kind of society that I believe the, the, the founders and framers of the Constitution uh, had in mind. Ed, before we get into some more detail on that, uh, you tell us, how long have you been a libertarian? Are you a lifelong classical liberal? I can't remember when I wasn't. I suppose I haven't. It took uh, through uh, perhaps the first couple of years of college before I actually was self-consciously calling myself a libertarian. But I've always uh, believed that the relations among individuals should be uh, based on voluntary uh, uh, activities, uh, that to the extent we can minimize coercion in society, uh, particularly with regard to our uh, personal activities or business relationships, to that extent we have a, f a freer, better, and, uh, and as a practical matter, a more prosperous society. So I have, uh, since uh, I guess uh, junior high school, uh, had libertarian uh, instincts, and uh, as I went through school I, I developed them more fully in into what I think is a profoundly important uh, political philosophy and one that is uh, internally consistent. Do you think a lot of people have libertarian instincts, if you would, and, uh, and aren't aware of it? I think that's true. There are, uh, in my view, a, a, there's a huge disenfranchised element of the American population. I think Americans inherently are libertarian, uh, that they basically uh, believe in uh, a combination of views that the 
conservative liberal dichotomy on the political spectrum do not adequately represent. Uh, I think, for instance, most conservatives, if you believe in a free market, the free enterprise system, you're offered a package deal that involves very often an intolerant attitude toward uh, uh, social relations and certainly a very militaristic one uh, in terms of international relations. Conversely, if you're very much concerned with peaceful relations among nations, as I am, uh, and you decide that you want to accept a liberal package, you're given uh, a package that includes income redistribution, uh, government control of the economy, and I think it's an it's, it's a, uh, unfortunate choice because I think there is a very, very large segment of the American population that is basically socially tolerant, have a laissez-faire, live and let live attitude. They may not uh, approve of a certain lifestyle or, or uh, literature or whatever, but they think that as adults that people have a right to make those decisions for themselves. Uh, they are skeptical of U.S. Uh, adventurism overseas, uh, uh, the, the arms race, the dangers of a militaristic foreign policy. And at the same time, they are appreciative of entrepreneurship, the free enterprise system. They see nothing wrong with people making money. And I think that's a unique combination of views that uh, uh, is frustrated right now by the political system. But I think Americans, in large part, are in a very fundamental sense libertarian. I'm not saying in a purely rigidly ideological sense, but in terms of their overall uh, views, I think there's a, an enormous number of people in this country who share those, those views. Where did you go to college? I went to Berkeley in the 60s. I went and then got an MBA at the University of Southern California, and I was in the investment business for several years. But um, You Californian by native? Uh, by born and raised in, in uh, California. I'm one of those few people who uh, likes uh, Southern California and Northern California. But I uh, went through Berkeley during a period of uh, radical uh, political upheaval, and I found that that experience at Berkeley was uh, uh, valuable in terms of learning the, the, the importance of, of uh, political principles. It was almost a nihilistic experience to see how students were uh, demanding that they be the ones to determine what the curricula was and, and uh, actually teach the courses and there was a de-emphasis on grades and, and competition. And, and it was a very, uh, almost a scary uh, uh, process to go through. At the same time, those students who uh, were uh, opposed to that sort of nihilism uh, very often were very actively in favor of the Vietnam War, and I couldn't make any sense of that venture, uh, uh, costing the lives of 50,000 young Americans uh, to fight a war that had uh, virtually no uh, strategic importance for the United States. It was not our war. And so I was, a, as a libertarian, kind of, of, of alone in those days. And, uh, and fortunately, uh, that was uh, over 20 years ago, fortunately that's not the case uh, today. I have a lot of company in sharing my views. You went into the uh, uh, business. You, you had a career in business before public policy, is that correct? I was a um, money manager, portfolio manager for a couple of national investment firms. I'm a chartered financial analyst and uh, I concluded eventually that my brilliance as an investor was probably less important to my client's success than, uh, than exogenous political forces. And I felt strongly that there uh, it was a need for some sort of uh, organized effort to try to get hold of the size, scope, and power of government and, and uh, reduce its importance to investors, to the economy, to our personal freedoms. And those ideas meant so much to me that I uh, opted to give up uh, my position in the investment business, much to the, uh, uh, much to the, the chagrin of my uh, bank account, I guess, but uh, it's been, a, it's been a psychologically satisfying uh, experience to, to be able to deal in this arena. Returning to Cato, uh, tell us a little bit more about what a public policy organization does. What we do basically is work with policy analysts and academics, scholars uh, who, are, uh, who share our classical liberal views 
and are interested in studying the various areas of public policy and developing proposals that uh, emphasize the private voluntary sector. Uh, my position has always been that uh, well, uh, let me backtrack. So there, I was in interviewed by Atlantic Monthly Magazine uh, a couple of years ago, and the young man doing the story said, well, what would happen if, if Cato got a uh, study that came in, you commissioned a study, came in, it called for more government intervention. It said government was the solution to this problem. I said I wouldn't publish it. And he thought that was outrageous, that that was intellectually dishonest or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Cato is a $2 million think tank, a small think tank. In my view, that there is this inherent bias toward government growth, that, uh, that there is literally billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of bureaucrats who are rationalizing uh, new uh, programs, new interventions, reasons for ex expanding current programs. Uh, and there, there's a need uh, in a free society for institutions outside of government to say, look, the government doesn't have to do that. Maybe, the, maybe that original program was the source of the problems in the first place. And certainly the intellectual trend today is, uh, is towards seeking out private sector, voluntary sector solutions to problems, trying to reduce the size of government and trying to, you, you can't really look at any field where government has an active role, whether it's retirement uh, or education or regulation, where the results have been satisfactory. And I think. Uh, intellectually honest people across the political spectrum today are looking for other alternatives. And that's what our scholars and that's what our policy analysts try to develop. And we, we do that through publishing books, shorter studies, we have seminars and conferences, we have a daily radio program called Byline. Uh, I think the Cato Institute is generally recognized as the most cost-effective think tank in, in the country. Certainly I don't know of any uh, institute that is, that is more cost-effective. We're an enormously productive uh, organization and uh, f have a very committed and talented staff. So I understand it. Your view is, uh, could be summarized something like that political leaders want to run other people's lives. Uh, is that true? Is that? Yeah, never trust anybody who was even elected to their high school student council. I, I think there is a tendency for uh, politicians to get so caught up when they come to Washington in the pomp and circumstance of the city, the, the power that they have, the media constantly looking at them, to really lose sight of who they are. They're just people like everyone else and they're pretty far away from, from the lives and concerns of the individuals they are supposed to represent and, and they s tend to uh, lack a little humility after a while and understand their own limitations. Uh, I don't think when, the, uh, when this country was founded that any of the uh, founders really considered the idea of career legislators. Today, somebody gets elected to Congress and they assume that they're going to be there the rest of their lives. And the way the system's set up, it's pretty hard to get them out once they're in there. Uh, so I do think there is a unfortunate bias in politics uh, toward people getting involved who view their role as to run other people's lives, and that strikes me as uh, alien to what this country is all about. Well, assuming that that's a, a shared uh, approach of all politicians, is there any other common ground on which all political philosophies stand that you perceive? A common ground on which all political philosophies? All political philosophies? All political philosophies. I don't, uh, I think that there are distinctly different political philosophies. Certainly the classical liberal philosophy in which this country was founded, the philosophy of Jefferson, Thomas Paine, George Mason, uh, was based on a Lockean respect for life, liberty, and property. Uh, that is, those are the principles that uh, you have to understand in order to understand the Constitution, in my view. There are other philosophies that assume that the individual should be subjugated uh, to some higher authority. Uh, sometimes it might be religion, more often than not, it's, uh, it's some state uh, authority. And, and uh, that is not what the great American experiment was all about. Ours was the first time in, in uh, history of Western civilization uh, when uh, a society was created based on rights. The government didn't grant rights to people, but rather 
uh, individuals formed a society and created a government in order to protect rights that they already had as individuals. Uh, a society based on individualism and on individual rights was unique. It was a break from the old world and what we see today to the extent that government has grown so dramatically in recent decades uh, is a return to really a reaction back to the old world uh, approach. As early as, as recently as, as 19, 1920s, uh, government spending at all levels of government uh, amounted to about 10 percent of personal income in this country. By 1950, that figure had risen to 26 percent. This year, 1987, the uh, spending of government at all levels amounts to about 44 percent of personal income. So we have a very ominous, bad trend based on a philosophy uh, uh, that does not respect individual rights. So I don't, I don't see that there's a common thread between all political philosophies, no. Did your work as a financial analyst in any way uh, shed any light on how people come to their political views? I'm not sure that the work as a, in, in my investment business uh, did that. I was disappointed that the investment industry per se was not more outspoken in defending <coughs> uh, a political position that was conducive to the free enterprise system. Uh, I do think that the uh, um, uh, people come to their own political convictions based very much on, on uh, environmental conditions and their own perception of, of uh, reality, but I think if you can stand back and uh, think through the principles that underlie political philosophy and be more um, disinterested in terms of what would create the best kind of a society that you're more inclined to, to move toward a classical liberal or libertarian position. Are Americans apathetic about government? Or are they? Well, I think uh, Americans may be apathetic about government. I think there's certain truth to that, but I think that's a healthy apathy. I think that uh, it's one thing to say that, well, Americans aren't voting that much or they're not, uh, they don't care what's going on in city uh, councils or, or in Congress, but I think that's, a, that's a, an intelligent skepticism or apathy, uh, that the system really is not rigged uh, in such a way that those people who want to uh, live their lives uh, without other people telling them how to do it or to keep their own earnings, uh, they're not interested in going to Washington uh, or going to their state uh, legislature. Uh, so I don't, I don't view the high non-voting percentage as sort of a, a, a bad citizen, uh, apathetic indication of what's wrong with our society. I think there's a growing and healthy skepticism about the uh, wisdom of, being, uh, of, of turning to government. But, but can't that apathy result in simply walking away and kind of letting government be the purview of a small minority that continues to do damage? Well, that's true. I, I'm not saying that, that uh, it's the best strategy. I'm saying it reflects something that is, I think, healthy, which is a skepticism of government. I think we need to offer Americans uh, policies and options, certainly politically, uh, that will rekindle their interest in and their confidence in the ability, uh, in their ability to turn things around. We've seen eight years of the most conservative, or seven, uh, of the most conservative president in half a century, and uh, government spending today is higher than it was when Ronald Reagan was first elected. So you can understand the, the, the cynicism. Well, yes, and isn't it likely to be uh, five years from now, ten years from now, uh, the possibility that we will have gone through other presidents and, and we will have seen the same lack of change. It's possible. <clears throat> it may even be likely. I think there, the great uh, achievement of Ronald Reagan was to bring back some interest in political philosophy in this country. Uh, he was able to articulate a vision of getting the government off our backs, a respect for rights, the efficacy of the free market. Uh, that America was a country that uh, uh, should be proud of its uh, history and its uh, social institutions. Uh, but it's n that's not enough. I mean, that was a major achievement because he did that in the context of 
a series of presidents from uh, Carter to Ford to Nixon, Lyndon Johnson, uh, people who really uh, didn't stand up or measure up much if you compared them to the, to the founders of this country. Uh, and certainly people who were not interested in political philosophy it was considered, it got to the point where it was, it was considered somewhat naive to even raise the issues that Ronald Reagan raised. Well, it turned out people responded very, very enthusiastically to those ideas. The problem with Reagan, uh, in my view in any case, is that uh, he turned out not to be a very good administrator. He appointed people to, for instance, the Department of Education, the Department of Energy, who were strong advocates of keeping and expanding the role of those departments, despite the fact that he had campaigned in 1980 on a pledge of abolishing them both, which uh, would, would make us all better off if, if they had been abolished. So I don't think he's a good administrator. I think this idea that a lot of conservatives point to Reagan and say, well, he's a great um, hands-off manager. You can't be a hands-off manager and roll back the great Leviathan in, in Washington. Uh, I don't, uh, during his eight years as governor of California, uh, state spending and taxes both increased at a higher rate than any time in modern California history in a real per capita basis. So uh, I don't think his record as administrator is that good. And what you need is a combination of his vision. I don't agree with all of it, but the basic idea of, of the goodness of our society and, and the respect for individual rights and a minimal role for government, that philosophy, I think, is, is a correct one. But it needs to be combined with a more hard-nosed and sophisticated approach at dealing with the entrenched bureaucracy and the nature of politics. So in a sense, a, are you saying that there is a dissatisfaction and it has to be tapped and that Cato's trying to put ideas forward that are going to grab the attention of these people, uh, our fellow citizens, and make some changes? Yeah, I think there is a serious uh, element of dissatisfied Americans and uh, Cato doesn't uh, as a think tank, is not involved in trying to uh, go out and popularize ideas to the mass of Americans. We're dealing with a fairly small uh, number of people that we're really interested in exposing these ideas to. Uh, certainly the media and people in politics, academics, uh, and the intelligent lay public. We have what we call a Cato sponsor program uh, that about 2,000 people participate in. Uh, and they are from the business community and doctors and lawyers and uh, individuals who uh, are concerned about turning things around uh, and they actively support us and, and are involved with what we're doing. Uh, so to that degree we do want to reach the intelligent lay public but I think ideas do come from what Hayek uh, referred to as, as the, the uh, intellectuals, the second-hand dealers in ideas, not the, not the brilliant scholars or anything but the people who are actively their business is ideas, media, academics, and, and policy people. Speaking of Hayek, uh, he devoted an entire book to the question of constitution, constitutional government. And as you know, uh, Nobel economists Friedman and Buchanan uh, also place some emphasis on constitutional change. Is that important? Is that a well, the, in a certain degree it is. I should mention that uh, Hayek and Buchanan are both uh, distinguished senior fellows at the Cato Institute. But they are correct in identifying uh, the sources of government growth. Uh, and they all view the Constitution as an important means of uh, controlling that. Buchanan's public choice school has pointed out what people now say, well, that's obvious, but uh, before Buchanan and Tulloch and the others at the Public Choice School started talking about it, uh, there was sort of an a, uh, unsophisticated uh, uh, acceptance of the high school civics approach to the way government worked, but in fact bureaucrats are self-interested, as the Public Choice School points out, and they do have an interest often in expanding their role, whether or not it's in uh, the public's interest to do so. Friedman has talked about the tyranny of the status quo, the um, idea that a given program may be debated for uh, years, decades even, but once it's passed Congress by one vote, from that point forward, the only debate is over whether its budget should be increased by 5% or 15%, the tyranny of the status quo. He says it's protected by an iron triangle, which consists of the direct beneficiaries of the, uh, of the program, the Congressional Oversight Committee, 
and then the bureaucracy that administers it. And as defenses go, uh, the, the Chicago Bears should have it so good because it's, a, uh, it's an institutional bias toward government growth. Uh, uh, there's another one, uh, just the, the simple fact that you have concentrated benefits and, and dif diffused costs to pay for those benefits. That uh, leads the beneficiaries of a program to come and testify and a and, uh, program that may cost you and me $1.50 uh, is going to ben benefit somebody uh, to the tune of hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. And so the, the testimony in Congress is skewed toward uh, more government growth. And the whole system in Washington is the most rigged game in the country. Uh, it's unfortunate that the media uh, seems a bit clueless uh, to that fact. They report what goes on in Washington with wide-eyed innocence as though the process itself is some sort of uh, honest arbitration of the national will, and that's just not the way it works. So what Hayek and Friedman and Buchanan are talking about is let's return to the constitutional principles and wh what they were designed to, to protect in America. The, the framers of the Constitution uh, understood that there was what uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson called the natural progress of things for government to grow and for liberty to give ground. Uh, and they thought the Constitution, or they hoped the Constitution, uh, would be a constraint on government growth. I think that um, all of those gentlemen uh, favor a balanced budget amendment, uh, which I, I favor too. I'm a bit skeptical about how uh, effective it would be in the long run. I think the government would figure out ways to get around that, but it's still, I think, a step in the right direction. And of course, we're fairly close. There are 32 states now that have uh, passed a balanced budget amendment, a couple more, and, and maybe we'll see how that will work in practice. But more important than that is a return to what the Constitution says. Uh, the economic liberties protected in the Constitution, the, uh, the Fifth Amendment, Article I, uh, Section 10, and the Fourteenth Amendment, these all have explicit, explicit guarantees of economic liberty. The Ninth Amendment uh, uh, says that, the, that, that we all have natural rights, uh, that government doesn't give us all our rights, and that we retain any rights that aren't explicitly given to the government. Uh, and those, those uh, uh, aspects of the Constitution have been overlooked ever since the Roosevelt Court. And there's a growing movement now, people in the Federalist Society, Richard Epstein at the University of Chicago, Stephen Macedo up at Harvard, uh, uh, young academics who are now saying uh, uh, one of the reasons we've got this uncontrollable government growth is because we've forgotten what the Constitution actually said. And I think that the, the movement to, to return to a, uh, a more clear interpretation of, of what the framers had in mind is a very healthy development. But isn't one of the problems the fact that uh, uh, some would say that uh, you're placing private property in a more important position than, a, than government uh, in a situation where there are poor people out there who, who, who are gaining nothing from private property. Well, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, taxes are at the level they are, and, and taxes, Social Security tax, for instance, is extremely regressive tax. Uh, it hits poor people the hardest. Uh, government welfare programs, as Charles Murray and others have pointed out, have been counterproductive in terms of the incentive structure they've uh, created. The uh, public school system has been a disaster in terms of what it's been able to do for inner city kids. Uh, we've created, in my view, in large part because of government programs, a permanent underclass in this society. And it seems to me that private property is, in fact, a liberating force. To the extent we can reduce regulation, we can make it easier for young people, uh, minorities, low-income individuals to get into business without having a phalanx of lawyers to do it for them. Uh, that will uh, we, we, We've cut off the bottom rungs of the economic ladder through our tax policies and through our regulatory policies. And to the extent that uh, private property can be expanded, not government welfare, but private property ownership of the property by the individual. It's a liberating force. It's a way to, to empower uh, more Americans. Uh, it's the, it's, it strikes me as though it's the government that's doing more damage to uh, poor people, than, uh, and it's not the, the institution of private property it's, that's the problem. It's the solution. You would then be, feel very positive toward the uh, suggestion that those in public housing 
would become owners of, of those units. That's a, a very good example of what I'm talking about. Of course, this has been tried in Great Britain under Thatcher's uh, government, and it's been wildly successful to the point where even the Labor, government, uh, Labor uh, Party, which is the Socialist Party over there, has uh, come up with sort of a lukewarm endorsement of the system. Uh, uh, the government owns the property. It's not kept up. Nobody, it's not in anyone's self-interest to keep it up. They don't get any increased value by doing that. Suddenly, they turn over ownership to the tenants in what are considered ghettos, and lawns are mowed, and flower beds are, are laid, and, and paints on the walls, and crime drops, uh, self-respect increases. So uh, as I say, I think private property is the solution to a lot of these inner city problems in particular. You certainly would ag acknowledge that, you know, it's kind of a struggle to accept the pains and realities of life. Uh, they're, they're on us all the time. Aren't we always going to turn to government in search of relief? Well, uh, we always can, but we don't always have to. I think that most people would rather have uh, the self-respect and independence that comes from uh, having control over their own lives. Uh, paternalistic government is something that is attractive to some people, unfortunately, but I don't think the vast majority of people. It's a, it's a phenomenon that demagogues and those who would use uh, uh, the plight of others to increase their own power have taken advantage of. But I don't, this country is not based on that instinctive turning to government every time there's a problem. Uh, government is just people, and mostly people who aren't as interested in uh, solving problems on an individual private basis as, as the general population is. Uh, people have problems, people can solve problems, uh, but the idea that somehow because somebody has uh, stationery that says they belong to some bureau uh, that has taxpayers' money, that that, that that person is better at solving the problem, I, I don't think is uh, valid. Uh, but as I say, I think you, you need some institutional, constitutional constraints uh, to uh, preclude the temptation that some have to look to government to solve problems. Well, the bureaucrat who's solving those problems, or supposedly working on what is his motivation? Uh, you know, what makes him tick, in a sense? Is he, is he, is he sincerely interested in solving those problems, uh, or am I to suppose that these are all con artists. Uh, no, I, th I, I agree with Milton Friedman that bureaucrats uh, uh, don't uh, wake up in the morning and, and say to themselves, how am I going to take advantage of the poor taxpayer? Uh, they simply are responding to a set of incentives that is not uh, conducive to solving problems. Uh, a bureaucrat is like anybody else. He's self-interested, and, uh, and uh, this is as true as a bureaucrat who's a general in the Pentagon as one who's a clerk in the Health and Human Services. They have their own incentives to improve their own situation within their working conditions, and that often involves uh, increasing the number of people under you. I have a little confession to make. When I was going to business school, I worked part-time for the Los Angeles County Board of Education in what was called the Salary Research Department. And what we would do is call up all the other uh, uh, school districts around the country and, and work up statistics on how much teachers at different levels were getting paid, and, and they'd use that in their teacher negotiations. Well, there, there were six of us in the, in the department, and I think maybe one person could have done it all, maybe one with a part-time helper could have done it all. But six people were getting full salaries to do this work. And when I left, after I got my MBA, I sat down with the head of the department, and he said, well, we're, we're submitting a budget to double the size of our staff, but uh, I think we'll only get a 50% increase. And I know that the school district would have said that, uh, uh, you know, this is a bare-bones budget. We're only giving this guy half of what he wants. And I don't think he was motivated by any sense of, uh, of stealing from the public or anything else. He probably rationalized it in his own mind. But the fact was that there was no market incentive to tell him or, or directives to tell him he was wasting money or that these people could have worked much harder or that he didn't need these people. It was in his interest to have more people working for him. That is how much of government growth is created. So it's, so it's activities or uh, promised activities 
more than results that really is at the bottom of government? It's very hard to determine results in government programs. I mean, to the extent you do see them, uh, look at the public education system. For two decades, you saw declining test scores in math and, and verbal. Uh, each of those years, real spending per pupil was increasing. And what is the response of the, of the bureaucracy, of the teachers' unions? Uh, more money. Uh, they, they didn't recognize that the problem is a systemic problem. There's no competition. They have a monopoly school system. Uh, they're getting more and more administrators. There's no rewards for good teachers. There's no opportunity for a parent to send their uh, kids to a school that's doing better than the school the child's in. So you have all the problems that you have with the monopoly. Uh, it was a systemic problem. You saw the results and still nothing was done. But in most instances, you can't even, you don't even know what the results, what the bottom line is supposed to be. Is this one of the negative um, results of a democratic society? Is that a... It, uh, undoubtedly it is. And I think that's why it's important in this bicentennial of the Constitution to recognize that the framers and the founders were individuals who said, yes, we have a democracy here, a democracy is an important element of our society, but it only deals with a certain part of society, that there's this broad sphere of human activity uh, that is not subject to some sort of a, uh, a plebiscite every other day where we all vote on what other people can do and how much of their money they can keep and how their businesses have to be run. Uh, America was founded on the idea that this was uh, a limited government designed to protect life, liberty, and property. Not some sort of, it, it wasn't democracy first, it was a republic first. Uh, and that is uh, clear in the, in the writings of, of, of people like James Madison, who's considered the father of the Constitution. And I think it's an important, uh, an important uh, element that's, that's been overlooked. Would you comment on uh try to help us understand the relationship between freedom and democracy. The, it's impossible to, to, to visualize any kind of society in modern times that could be free without a democracy. At the same time, the democracy has to be limited or else it overwhelms the freedom. The freedom has to be, we have to be able to elect uh, government officials. We, we can't have a dictatorship or an autocracy. We need a, uh, a system that allows participation of all the citizens uh, to express their uh, uh, preference for uh, the officials who would run the government. But the government itself, in order to have freedom, has to be strictly limited. And that's the problem that we, we've run into. We've gotten to the point where the the uh, institutional and constitutional constraints that were designed to keep this inherent bias toward government growth we've been talking about at bay uh, have been overwhelmed by uh, a uh, emphasis on pure majoritarianism or democracy, which uh, is not what the framers had in mind. And, and that's when rights and freedom get trampled. The, the real tyranny of, uh, in terms of threats to human freedom and liberty come uh, very often from the majority. Isn't the tyranny of the status quo inevitable? Isn't it, isn't it part of, of all organizations? Not necessarily. There is a, a, a tendency toward that, but uh, if the, uh, the system in which you're working uh, is a competitive one, where there are constant demands on, uh, as, as a capitalist system um, uh, creates these kinds of demands for improvement, for, uh, uh, to, to offer a better product constantly and not to become stagnant, uh, then that doesn't happen. It's what Schumpeter called creative destruction of, of capitalism. Uh, America was not based on a status quo uh, rigid system of keeping everything the way it is, although that is what a lot of people look to government for, whether it's unions or businesses who are trying to uh, protect uh, uh, their market share from foreign uh, products. Uh, very often the government is used as the institution uh, to protect the status quo. 
But this country is based on constant change. That's what freedom's all about. People have, people's values change, new products are entered, uh, are created, and it's, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's a, a process of constant creative change uh, that is the essence of freedom in a free society. Uh, only when you have institutions that can coercively force things to stay the way they are uh, do you uh, have this bias toward the status quo. And, and uh, I think in a free society you have constant change whether you want it or not. But that, <coughs> that change seems, in the United States anyway, to be still occurring in the marketplace, in the economic marketplace, but it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, changing in the government. In other words, there we seem to have a, a one-way one street. Well, that's true. I think uh, in terms of intellectual trends, there probably has never been a greater divergence between the dominant thinking in, say, the policy community and the way government operates. There was a CBS News um, New York Times poll last year that showed that 83 percent of the American people would like to see the budget balance through spending cuts. 83 percent, that's an overwhelming percentage of Americans who favor that. And yet, is there anyone in Congress, or a handful of people, who say that that can be done? Everybody else, including Ronald Reagan, uh, has given up on that uh, uh, concept. So you have a disparity of views, both from the American public standpoint, from the intellectual public policy community standpoint, uh, and, and what government is actually doing. And, that is the $64 question these days. What can we do to, to change this inherent, uh, uh, inexorable upward ratcheting of government growth? And it's not an easy, easy thing to deal with. It's going to take some political leadership uh, of, the, of the kind uh, we were talking about earlier. Can you give us an example of uh, one change that Cato has uh, researched that, that uh, you think would would uh, start us in that direction? Well, I think one program that's particularly interesting is uh, work that our adjunct scholar Peter Ferrara has done in the area of Social Security. Social Security was sold to the American people as a supplemental safety net kind of retirement vehicle. It has turned in, as so many government programs do once they get started, uh, to a program where today the majority of retired Americans get the majority of their income from Social Security. Uh, today the majority of Americans pay more in Social Security tax than they do in uh, income taxes. And according to the Social Security system's own projections, uh, early in the next century those taxes are going to have to be increased by up to 70 percent possibly more. I mean, the Social Security Administration's optimistic projections generally tend, uh, uh, tend to be pessimistic in terms of, uh, of inflation and, and uh, recessions and that sort of thing. Also, they're always disappointed when people live longer. They're never prepared <laughs> for that. But uh, so the Social Security system, we think, is, 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 a, is in bad shape, that when the baby boom generation retires and the smaller generation behind it, is there with this enormous tax burden that the system will break down. I think most people under 40 today would, would like to opt out and we've developed a plan that would allow them to do that called the super IRA plan uh, that would allow younger workers to take a certain amount of money up to 100 percent of what their payroll tax is now and get a dollar for dollar income tax credit against it if they put it into this investment account uh, which they would own. Uh, and th But the payroll tax would still be paid so that people now on Social Security or, or who wanted to stay on the program would be guaranteed their benefits. The advantages of the program are that, number one, it would, it would uh, provide a much higher level of retirement income than Social Security now only promises. Uh, two, you would own the corpus of the money you paid in. It seems rather callous to me that we have this giant government retirement system called Social Security and you don't own the corpus of the money that you paid into the system. If you die, it's gone. It's, it, you can't leave it to your children. You can't, uh, you can't decide to spend it yourself, the, uh, the principal that you've paid in. Um, and it's, uh, it's a system that uh, uh, would provide what we're proposing, uh, the super IRA program, would provide capital to the economy. 
a pay-as-you-go social security system, and I think more and more people come, have come to understand that there is no giant social security fund, it's just a pay-as-you-go system. The money you pay in payroll tax today goes to somebody's retirement check uh, tomorrow. Uh, the kind of system we're proposing would create capital. Uh, Hayek talks about the unintended consequences of government intervention, and I think uh, this is a prime example of that. I don't think when people first designed Social Security, they, they, they considered the fact that, well, listen, if we replace people's retirement savings with a government program, how are they going to react? And one way they react is they don't save for their own retirement. They don't buy stocks, bonds, put money into savings accounts because they think the government's doing it for them. And as a result, savings, uh, unintended consequence, savings dry up. And that, uh, that uh, costs us jobs. Uh, it costs us economic vitality. So our program, we think, uh, would be enormously popular. In fact, uh, Pete DuPont, who's running for president as a Republican uh, this year, has endorsed a version of this plan. So has the Heritage Foundation, so has the U.S. Chamber Foundation. So it's an idea that Cato developed and floated, and more and more people are getting enthusiastic about it. Does wealth arise from liberty, or is it an abuse of liberty? Well, what do you think I'm going to answer to that? Well, that was, I gave you one there. That's <laughs> well, right down the middle, home run. Uh, wealth is something that's created. It's not something uh, that is static there to be divvied up and shared by everyone. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phenomenon uh, that is a happy byproduct of a free society where people are in a position. You know, the, the capitalist system is not a system the way socialism is. It's simply what happens when you leave people alone. They trade with each other, they try to, they make contracts with each other, uh, they try to please consumers, they try to, to uh, create new products that will please people. Uh, wealth creation is, is the dynamic of a free society. And it's, uh, th this is a lesson that's particularly germane today during all the talk about protectionism because uh, the protectionist attitude is that there is only so much wealth in the country and that if somebody if somebody's buying a product from abroad then that means that much wealth is not being uh, used in this country uh, and it's a static uh, uh, analysis that doesn't reflect the reality of, of uh, how a dynamic free international economy generates new wealth and new capital so in a sense, we create wealth in the United States, we're prosperous, despite, not because of government. Absolutely. No, there's no question that uh, we would be a more prosperous society today if we didn't have a uh, federal government that was uh, accounted for 24 percent of gross national product, or government spending at all levels that uh, amounted to 44 percent of personal income. Uh, the, the, the dead hand of government is not a uh, is not an element in creating wealth. Turning to a different area, you have identified yourself as a strong anti-communist, but at the very same time you've expressed serious concerns about foreign policy, about defense spending. Briefly explain to us uh, this apparent dichotomy. Well, it's, uh, it may be an apparent dichotomy. I don't think it is a dichotomy. I think uh, uh, you know, the libertarian or classical liberal philosophy is obviously diametrically at odds with a philosophy of complete government control, which is what communism is. But I don't think if we want to compete with that kind of a system that we should uh, adopt their tactics and become a giant militaristic state that's inter uh, that is sort of covertly and overtly uh, trying to control the affairs of other nations. Uh, I'm not against defense spending. I think we ought to spend whatever is required to ensure our integrity and safety as a nation. But I think there's a big difference between what the Pentagon budget is, military spending, and defense spending. Uh, we're spending $300 billion in the military budget. 140 of it goes for NATO. Well, the NATO countries, absent the United States, have more than twice the GNP of the Soviet, Soviet bloc countries, including the Soviet Union. They have superior technology, a larger population, uh, and yet we're paying for most of NATO. And I think that's just Parkinson's law of being alive and well at the Pentagon. We're spending $20 billion a year on Korea. Uh, maybe that made sense, some sense right after the Korean War, but 
my goodness, our original rationale to be there was because of uh, communist China, which now, if anything, is a military ally. And now South Korea has five times the GNP of North Korea, twice the population, and we're saying that they can't defend themselves. We're spending billions and millions of dollars. So I think there's lots of room to reduce the military budget and, in fact, enhance our national security by decreasing the chance that we're going to get involved in some local conflict uh, that could escalate into a nuclear exchange with the Soviets. I don't see anything consistent with free enterprise, limited government, and free markets and a huge military bureaucracy. And, and, and why do we have ships in the Persian Gulf today as, we, as we're taping this? Uh, to me, they're just floating uh, Beirut barracks where young men are being put in harm's way for no good reason. Uh, Ronald Reagan won the war in the Persian Gulf the day he decontrolled oil. That oil is not important to the United States. It's important for Iran and Iraq to keep those sea lanes open. Uh, we don't have to worry about them closing it down. But even if they did, it's such a small percentage of, uh, of the amount of oil that we uh, import and, and consume uh, that it would mean pennies at the gas station. And for that, uh, the, the amount of money we're spending in the Persian Gulf today because of this bureaucratic incentive to use our 600-ship navy uh, amounts to about $40 billion, which is a year, which is adding like $10 a barrel of oil. Uh, it doesn't make any sense for us to be there. Uh, there are lots of examples of, uh, of that, but I, I think the traditional American view, in fact, it used to be an old right view of Senator Taft and others, uh, was we don't have, uh, we minimize entangling alliances, and, and the real defense against communism, against the Soviet Union, is a free and prosperous society here. The battle, in, in a large degree, has is, is been won ideologically. Uh, and I think that uh, if we can avoid conflict, if we can avoid the military budget tearing down our own economy, uh, that it's inevitable that, uh, that communism will uh, continue to wither in the world. Are foreign policy uh, equally uh, adrift? Well, of course, I think it is. I think uh, we have this view that uh, the United States should be the world's policeman. And I don't think that's the way the world wants it, and I don't think it's in our interest to, to do that. If we look at those countries where we've had this uh, serious uh, interventionist protectorate mentality, whether it's uh, Nicaragua or the Philippines or Iran, uh, El Salvador, there's enormous problems. And it's a lot of the, the anti-American sentiment uh, is, is a direct result of the State Department and U.S. foreign policy being uh, dictated by us taking the moral low ground, uh, wanting just stability, wanting pro-American people in power. So we support a, a tin horn dictator like Ferdinand Marcos through four presidencies. Uh, he, he, is, he destroyed the economy there through his crony capitalism, through the bribes and the corruption. Uh, we supported him. And now there's a very strong communist insurgency in the Philippines, and I think it's a direct result of this uh, interventionist, manipulative uh, foreign policy we have. I don't think it wins us friends, and I think in the long run it, it plays into the hands of the communists. Is it accurate to describe your position, both regarding domestic and foreign issues, as one favoring uh, more emphasis on consistent application of principles rather than expediency or practical politics? I would say that that's a fair way to present what I'm trying to get across, that uh, there are guidelines uh, for uh, maintaining a free and safe and prosperous society. Uh, there are rules of the game. Uh, Jefferson called them the guiding light of the revolution, the principles of, uh, of uh, limited government. And they apply in the international area as well as domestically. If Hayek was right about unintended consequences, in terms of government intervention in the domestic economy. Uh, he was right in spades in terms of uh, how that applies to government intervention abroad, because there you're dealing with cultures and societies that are completely alien to, to us, and uh, we just don't know what these interventions will, will do. And, and in most cases, they turn out to be counterproductive, as I say. Is part of the problem in uh, regard to foreign policy that we really haven't uh, as we've grown up, we've, we've kind of become unsure as to what we are and what we stand for. 
Is that part of the problem? Yes. I think that's right. I think there is a, uh, to a certain degree, certainly among politicians, a lack of confidence in the rightness of America. Uh, and that lack of self-confidence manifests itself in us trying to make everybody else be like us. So we go out and force everybody to be that way because we can't, uh, we don't have enough confidence that ultimately they'll see the wisdom of, of the kind of society that we have. I think America is tremendously respected around the world by most people. I don't think the American government is. And I think uh, it, it, that uh, people are not dumb. They see the way the Soviet Union works. They see the oppression. They see the lack of economic progress. Uh, they're not going to opt for that kind of system. Uh, but uh, as long as we take the attitude that we control their, their lives, that we uh, ultimately are, are uh, uh, more important than the integrity or the sovereignty of these other countries, then we're, there's going to be resentment, and, and uh, that's going to cause problems. Is the structure of our society one that we've endured, enjoyed, prospered with for 200 plus years, is that a model that can work for uh, developing nations? I think so. I think that the, the problem uh, in developing nations is not a lack of capital, it's a lack of a political system that respects private property and has free political expression. Uh, if you build a hotel in a third world country and there's no guarantee that the government won't uh, confiscate it the next week, well, there's no capital. Nobody will, uh, nobody will buy that hotel. Nobody will invest in it. But if there's a guarantee of the security of it, then you've got some capital. You've created something. Capital will go immediately to countries like Hong Kong, for instance. Uh, where you have uh, a, a protection of property rights. And I think the, the absence of, of, of property rights in the third world is the major problem there. Our foreign aid programs, whether it's the Agency for International Development, the IMF, or the World Bank, or the State Department itself, uh, tends to be government-to-government -government aid, which uh, increases the centralization of, of these third world economies, uh, subsidizes industries and makes them uh, less efficient, just as subsidized industries in the U.S. are less efficient. Uh, so I think that policy is not the right policy. The way we sh should go with the third world is to emphasize uh, the kind of political system we have here and the, uh, the need to respect property rights and to keep taxes down. Then you'll see some economic growth there. For over 10 years, you and Cato have been engaged in this public policy battle. Do you have reason to believe that significant change is possible? in our system? Well, I think there's a moral imperative to try to change the system in any case. Uh, I think change is possible. I think we're uh, at a point in time when more Americans are willing to consider alternatives, are, are uh, not buying the line that government is the solution to all problems, whether economic or uh, international, uh, and that, that these ideas need to be articulated and they need to be promoted as we try to do. And I think a, uh, a large number of Americans are just waiting to hear them because uh, uh, the policies of the past have, have failed us and uh, all, we, all we need to do is, is to uh, remember our heritage and start adopting policies that emphasize uh, the market and, and private property and individual rights and I think people are, are willing to, are ready to turn to those policies.